Can you describe at a high level what are the different schools of economics, perhaps ones that are interesting to you, perhaps ones that the difference between which reveals something useful or insightful for our conversation. Okay. So, you know, you could, neoclassical, post-Keynesian, uh, Austrian, I like the biophysical uh, economics and so on, other heterodox economic schools that you find interesting. Okay. I actually find interesting a school which went extinct about 250 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's where I'd like to start from. And they're called the physiocrats. And the name itself implies where their knowledge came from because if you go back far enough in history, we didn't we didn't do autopsies. But when you started doing autopsies, they found wires, they found tubes, et cetera, et cetera. And they started seeing the body as a circulation system and they applied the same sort of logic to the economy. And they came out of an agricultural economy, which was France, and they saw that the wealth came effectively from the sun. So they saw all wealth comes from, they said the soil, but what they really mean is sun, the soil absorbs the energy of the sun. One seed plants, a thousand flea seeds come back. There is no surplus. Uh, we are simply mining what we can find out of the natural economy. That's where we should have stayed and, and developed from that forward. Uh, we then went through the classical school of economics, which comes out of Adam Smith. And Smith, uh, coming from Scotland, looked at what the physiocrats said, and what the physiocrats argued was that agriculture is the source of all wealth, and the manufacturing sector is sterile. That's literally the term they use to describe the manufacturing sector. What does sterile mean? Sterile means you don't you don't extract value; you simply change the shape of value. So the the value comes from the soil. The value comes from the soil. That's the free gift of nature. That's literally the phrase they used. And we then distribute the free gift of nature around, and we need carriages, which was the manufacturing term they used at the time, uh, as well as uh, wheat. Mm -hmm. So we, to make the carriages, we take what's been taken from the soil and we convert it to a different form, but there is no value added in manufacturing. Yeah. So Smith looked at that and said, well, I'm from Scotland, yeah? and we've got these- Easy now. <laughs> industries, you know, and we make stuff and it's machinery. And he said, no, it's not land that gives us the source of value, it's labor. Yeah. Now, that led to the classical school of thought, and that said that all value comes from labor, uh, that value is, uh, is objective, so it's the amount of effort you put in, that the price two things will exchange for reflects the relative effort that's involved in the manufacturing. So this computer takes two hours to make and this bottle takes two minutes to make, then there's, this is worth 60 times as much as that. Okay? They didn't talk about um, marginal cost. It was absolute cost, effectively. They didn't talk about utility as a subjective thing. They ridiculed sub subjective utility theory. That led to Marx. And Marx is probably the most brilliant mind in the history of economics. The only other competitor I'd see is Schumpeter, possibly Keynes. But in my terms of ranking of intellects, it would be Marx, Schumpeter, Keynes in terms of the outstanding capacities to think. But Marx then turned that classical school, which was pro-capitalism and anti-feudal, into a critique of capitalism, mm -hmm. which led to the neoclassical school coming along as a defense of capitalism. But they defended it using the ideas of the subjective theory of value, so that value does not reflect effort. It's the satisfaction individuals get from different objects that determines their value, marginal utility. It's the marginal cost that determines how much they sell for. Capitalism equilibrates marginal cost and marginal utility. And the concepts of equilibrium and marginal this and marginal that became the neoclassical school. And that's still the dominant school now, 150 years later. So that's the one that everybody learns. And when you first learn economics, if you don't have the critical background that I managed to acquire, uh, that's what you think is economics, mm -hmm. the marginal utility, equilibrium uh, oriented analysis of mainstream economics. And for example, they ignore money. Okay? People think economists, you must be an expert on money because you're an economist. Well, in fact, economists learn literally in the first few weeks at university that money is irrelevant. They say money illusion. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they represent people's uh, tastes using what they call indifference curves. And they're like isoquants on a, on a weather map. If you look at an isoquant, it shows you all the points of the same pressure. So you can be, you know, you can be he here or you can be in Denver and the air pressure can be the same if you're in the same weather unit. So you just draw a cell mm -hmm. that links together. Well, they do the same thing with utility and say lots of bananas 
and very few coconuts can give you the same utility as lots of coconuts and very few bananas. And you draw a basically a like a hyperbola running down and linking the two. And they'll say, well, that's that's your utility. That describes your tastes. And then we have your income. And there's given your income, you can buy that many um, bananas completely or that many coconuts or a straight line combination of the two. Mm-hmm. And then if we double the price, nominal price of coconuts and double the nominal price of bananas and double your income, what happens? And the correct answer is, oh, nothing, sir. You know, you stay at the same point of tangency between what your budget is and which particular utility curve gives you the maximum satisfaction. So that gets ingrained into them. And they think anybody who worries about money suffers from money illusion. You know, you, you are therefore uh, ignorant of the deep insights of economics if you think money actually matters. So you have an entire theory of economics, which presumes we exchange through barter. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'll, I'll swap you that Microsoft Surface for... Uh, actually, I'll take two of those for one of these. You know, we do this bartering type arrangement. In fact, that only works if money plays no creative role in the economy. And that's where you'll find reading Schumpeter, uh, the insight that's the school of thought that I come from that says money is essential. Money actually adds to demand. And I'll, I'll talk, we'll talk about that later on. So that's the neoclassical school that ends up being subjective theory of value, uh, non-monetary, as though, as though everything happens in barter, and focusing on equilibrium, as though everything happens in equilibrium. Or if you get disturbed from equilibrium, you return back to it again. And that mindset describes capitalism. Its most interesting feature is that it reaches equilibrium. Now, what planet are we on to believe that? Because if you look at the real world, the real uh, uh, exciting world of capitalism in which we, we live, change is by far the most obvious characteristic of it. There's no equilibrium. There's no equilibrium. It's unstable. And as a mathematician, it's easy to, you, you work with stability analysis. You know, you work out what the, uh, the Jacobian is, you work out your the Lyapunov exponents in a complex system. You're used to the idea that equilibrium is unstable. But economists get schooled into believing that everything happens in equilibrium, and they don't learn stability analysis. So all that stuff is missing. So onto the schools of thought, um, the treating the economy as an equilibrium system, which was what the class, neoclassical school did, is what Keynes disturbed. Mm-hmm. And he really disturbed it by talking about, fu- fundamentally, that uncertainty determines our decisions about the future. So when we consume, you know, you know if you like Pfizer or whatever your particular drink you want to have, you know the current situation. But to invest, you must be making guesses about the future. But you don't know the future. So what do you do? You extrapolate what you currently know. And this, as you said, this is a terrible basis on which to plan for the future. But this is the only thing you can do when there, where there is no possibility of solid calculation. So investment is therefore subject to uncertainty. And therefore, you will get volatility out of, out of, out of investment. You will get... Uh, Fads, of course, booms and slumps coming out of that because people extrapolate forward the current conditions. And that's the normal state of a capitalist economy. And Schumpeter argued that that's what gives us its creativity as well. The fact that you um, can perceive a potential demand, but you don't, uh, first of all, you don't know whether that demand's going to work. Secondly, you don't know who your competitor's going to be, whether somebody's going to be ahead of you or behind. If there's a fad, you'll overinvest, okay? Um, all this stuff is the real nature of capitalism. And that's what we should be trying to capture, the dynamic, non-equilibrium, monetary violence and creativity of capitalism. That's what we should be analysing. And the post-Keynesian school has gone in that orientation. Um, they've been, in my opinion, inhibited by learning their mathematics from neoclassical economists. So they don't have enough of the technology of complex systems. There's only a really tiny handful of people working in complex systems analysis in post-Keynesian economics. But that is, to me, the most interesting area. So their their tools may be lacking, but they fundamentally accept the instability of that's things. That's right, that's right. And so that's what makes them interesting. So let me, let me try to summarize what you said, and then you say how stupid I am. Okay, so then there was the uh, physiocrats mm-hmm. that thought value came from the land. Yep. Then there's Adam Smith, who said, nah, value comes from human labor. Uh, that was that was the classical school. Mm-hmm. 
And then neoclassical is uh, value comes from like bananas and coconuts, the prefer human preferences, yeah. like human happiness, how, how happy, how happy a banana makes you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Keynesian and the post Keynesian were like, yeah, well, you can't, you can't, you can never, the moment you try to put value to a banana and a coconut, you're already working in the past. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always going to be chaos and stability. And then you just, you're, you're fishing in uncertain waters. And that's, we have to embrace that and come up with tools that model that well.